Lucy, Lucy, welcome. Hi, Paul. How are you? It's mor morning, afternoon where, where I am, Morn morning where you morning are. Morning where I am. So. And la late afternoon in, in San Francisco. So I guess it depends on where everyone else is in the world. But welcome. And why, why don't we start, Lucy? I think, you know, there's probably a lot of people in the audience who know the Airwalk story very well. There are other people who are less familiar with the story. Let's talk about the story of, of Air Wallex and, and I guess how you got to this point uh, from, from, from your beginnings a few years ago. Yeah, so Air Wallex was founded in uh, 2015 in Melbourne. And uh, so basically the story was that my co-founders, Jack and Max, started a cafe in Docklands. So most people probably don't know where that is, but it's somewhere in Melbourne. And... Um, while they were still working full time uh, for the bank and Max was an architect. And they were importing a lot of products um, such as coffee cups, uh, labels for their cafe from China and basically found the process very, uh, you know, very difficult and was very expensive uh, for small businesses to transact um, cross currencies and cross border as well. And so, yeah, basically we teamed up with a fourth co-founder and also joined by um, one of Jack's ex-colleagues. So five of us started Air Wallex in December of 2015. And we've just really been focusing on um, building uh, financial infrastructure for payments and for businesses to really scale cross-border. And yeah, it's, and it's been a hell of a journey since then. <laughs> It's been a lot's happened in, 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 just yes. over, in just over five years. Talk about, I mean, you were very clear um, a, from day one about a, a, a building a sort of a global business, a global vision. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about how you brought that vision to life over the last five years. Yeah, so I think uh, for the first at least six to 12 months, we were really still ex um, exploring what to do because you know, we, we knew we wanted to build a solution for businesses, but what does that actually look like? It's, it's a bit, um, still a little bit unclear. Um, and also, you know, how do you solve problems that's across regions, across, you know, different geographic um, areas, industries as well. Um, so our focus at that time was really B2B tra transactions and predominantly on e-commerce as well, because that's, one of the areas that was being digitized the first and also where we saw the most commonalities between the um, customers across the regions as well. Um, yeah, but then we soon realized we can't just uh, only rely on traditional infrastructure. So i.e. the banks and, and you know, um, things that were built a little bit earlier than, uh, than us. And um, there was also a lot of compliance issues that we, want, we needed to solve. So um, yeah, we invested basically a lot of time, resources, and money into building our own infrastructure. And basically it's a settlement uh, network um, and a set of FX engines where we can power our own transactions and we can basically uh, decide how the game is played. And um, so we're not purely relying on um, the legacy technology, but also I guess, in a way, transforming into something that's more modern and that's more suited for what our customers need. Um, but in saying that, you know, um, you know banks being exist forever and um, a lot of our customers still heavily rely on the, uh, you know, the banking sector for their business needs. So um, I wouldn't say we're trying to replace what is in existence, but in a way, uh, I guess, transform it in the, uh, so that, you know, businesses can really, um, you know, I guess, uh, operate uh, in the modern world without worrying about all those, you know, uh, difficulties. And, and Lucy, I guess, you know, I, I guess from my perspective, the, the, the vision has grown and evolved a lot over the last five years, but it's very much stayed consistent with that, with that, with that original vision. And I guess you've built on that rather than sort of, you know, pivoting or changing course in any way. Let's talk about the next two or three or four years. What, what's the what's the direction of the business? What is some of the sort of the, you know, expansion plans you can look to put in place, whether it's geographic perspective, product perspective, customer-based perspective, what does the business look like over the next few years? Yeah, so um, like I said, we, we really spent the five year, uh, past five years, you know, on building that infrastructure. And then, you know, we, 
don't really want to be just an infrastructure company. We also want to really, you know, solve the problem. And that's by, you know, softwares or um, platform services or solutions. So I think our key focus, um, you know, we still um, want to expand our coverage um, and optimize, optimize that infrastructure and then the, <clears throat> the product that we have built. But also, um, you know, in terms of geographic regions, we want to expand beyond just APAC because I think we are still quite APAC focused at the moment. Um, but obviously, you know, thinking about um, in a global sense, we need to be present in, um, you know, Europe, we need to be present in North America, and we've really been preparing ourselves for that over the past year. And um, yeah, and I, I think, like you said, you know, the vision has evolved and then we realized that, you know, in terms of SME banking, it's very different to, you know, your enterprise, uh, you know, banking. And, but we really believe that, you know, what we built can be uh, suited for businesses of all sizes. So we don't really distinguish in a sense of how we build our platform, but how um, the application is, you know, uh, I guess, uh, built from a user perspective, uh, user experience perspective can be a little bit different. So, um, yeah, and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, from that perspective, then we, we want to be expanding into like, for example, billing and expense management and, you know, um, areas where in, in that whole ecosystem, we can help our, bus um, our business users um, to scale their own businesses. Got it. And I think, you know, it's obviously a lot has changed in, in five years from, from an idea to a business today with, I think, about 500 people or thereabouts in the organisation. Um, I think it's something like nine or 10 offices around the world. So it's, it, is, it has been a really, really rapid journey over a five-year period of time. Talk about how you've got some of the challenges you've faced scaling the business, how you've overcome those challenges. Um, how you kind of work out the, you know, the, the right questions to ask. I mean, you know, often questions can kind of be, you know, lend themselves to answers and, and really smart folks can work out, you know, answers to questions. But often the hardest part is working out exactly what those questions are. I'm going to talk a little bit about those challenges of scaling and how you've gone about doing it. Yeah, I think... You know, everyone at Airwall is sort of took on multiple roles during the last five, five years, you know, whether uh, it's an early joiner or someone who joined us fairly recently. Um, and I, I think it is only this year that we started to really see the benefit of scale. So we, we then now have like people very focused on one area, um, someone who's really good at, you know, that key, key position. Uh, whereas, you know, like all of the founders and senior management took on multiple roles before. And um, yeah, so I think we're very focused on just building a very high performance culture and employer brand now. Um, so we just refreshed our values two months ago. And, you know, our key focus at the moment is really hiring leaders, experts, and emerging talents. So one of the things that we didn't really do I guess a lot of before is hiring grads. So we didn't really have a lot of like, because we didn't have time to train grads. And also I think from a grads perspective, you need to, like you said, you know, what is the question that you want them to solve, right? We don't, we didn't even know that. But now I think, you know, um, we, we are building our own culture and it's really, you know, encourages you know, openness and curiosity um, where people can come in and then they can both, you know, ask the questions and also find solutions to those questions. Um, yeah, so, and then we also made that like sort of one of our key goals this year because we really believe that, you know, having that startup um, journey and mentality means that you really need to focus on the people and people is what, you know, makes every company a little bit different and is what, you know, solves the problems at the end of the day. So, I mean, you know, so as you grow and as you scale, you're able to attract more people in the organisation, people with, with different experiences, different backgrounds. You talk about the fact that now you've got a whole lot more specialist skills within the organisation you had previously. So there's a, a whole lot of, a lot of benefits of growing and scaling. One of the hard parts, particularly, the, you know, given you've got so, you know, given that the number of people have grown so fast, dealing with the challenges of COVID, dealing with the fact you've got so many offices around the world in different time zones. How, what are some of the things you've done to sort of 
maintain that sort of startup culture and that startup mindset that I think, you know, people who know where Rolex really well, you know, kind of see it as, you know, part of the DNA of the organisation? Um, so I think one of the things that, like, we've been doing was that we, we've always been sort of global by default. So even prior to COVID, because of all the offices being spread out in different locations and, you know, we needed experts from different um I guess, areas and they just not happen to be where you actually want to hire that role. So we've been quite flexible with where we hire people. So in terms of geographic regions, we are perfectly fine with someone who's really good at what they're doing, but not sitting in one of the offices. Um, but obviously before, you know, you can get them to travel, you can get people to meet face to face. Now it's a little bit harder, but um, Zoom is, I guess, a, a second best option at the moment. Um, Ideally, I think, you know, face-to-face -face interaction is still quite important when you're um, growing a company, I guess. But, um, yeah, we make it work. Um, yeah, so I think that's sort of how we solve. Uh, that's just how we always been. So it's not like we suddenly transition to everyone being online during COVID. Um, so our transition was actually a quite easy because it's just, you know, more Zoom meetings. And there was less change for, for, for the last time. Um, and also, I think we had the benefit of, you know, some of the main offices not being areas where there's a lot of restrictions. So our Shanghai office has been operating since March last year. Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the good things. But also, obviously, it also comes with a lot of challenges, you know, in terms of you know, working with different time zones. Now we are unable to have a global hands for all of the offices because we have both US and Europe offices. But um, for example, we, we, we basically rotate between different time zones. So there's always, always a friendly time for one of the offices <laughs> for one of the all hands. And yeah, you keep the meetings, you know, short and you don't, you, you know, so people are not like, uh, constantly being dragged into different meetings at the weird times. Um, and I think that the, you, you, nothing is perfect at the very beginning. Um, and you discover ways to make it work and you, you change like over time. And now I think we sort of found, a, not I wouldn't say perfect formula, but a close to perfect formula where we can make all of the offices work together and have yeah. that engagement. Yeah, great. And and let's talk a little bit about for you personally. And so, you know, I think you spent quite a few years growing up from memory, Lucy, in New Zealand. Um, you the, the, obviously were living in Australia when the business started. You're now living in, in Shanghai. Talk about the evolution of your role and, and your areas of focus and also just the dynamic between you and your four co-founders and, and how that dynamics changed because I imagine early on, like the five of you were together all the time and discussing every issue. And of course, that's non scalable. Yeah, one of, <laughs> yeah, one of the great things about having five founders is you can have, you know, quite yes. broad areas of responsibility. But I'd love to firstly just talk a little bit about your role and how, how that's evolved in the last five years. Um, I think one of my key strengths is that I'm always quite. Like I'm not a very stubborn person, <laughs> you know Jack, right? So I think I know, we, I know we, Jack. We are you saying he's also everything. not a stubborn person, or you're saying he could be a little bit stubborn on occasion? So I think in terms of personality, we're very complementary, um, <laughs> and in terms of skill set, we're also very complementary. So um, in the early days, basically, I did everything other than writing writing the the software and and the codes. So um, from finance to anything and and Funnily, like all of the regulators used to, um, you know, also require you to be there physically. So there was a lot of traveling involved when we we're setting up the offices in the early days. Um, uh, thankfully, you know, a lot of places now accept e-signature and <laughs> video conferences. Um, so we don't have to split ourselves into different pieces and ship ourselves over the world. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of traveling involved. Um, Jack and I did most of the business development in the early days, as well as mm -hmm. fundraising. So there was a lot of conversation with external um, clients, investors, and that really helped us to um, build on that vision as well, right? Like, because 
in the beginning, it's sort of like you, you have that vision and you have that goal that you want to head towards, but there's a lot of missing pieces in between. And all of those things come up when you're talking to customers, for example, then you realize you know, their pain points, what they're looking for. And in my perspective, the best business or corporate development is that you actually can tell the client what they need rather than them you know, telling you what you need, uh, what they need. So um, there's a lot of those going on. And um, then I sort of became more um, brand and communications focused because we started to getting a, a, a lot more attention, um, you know, from the media, from just a brand perspective, you know, um, whether it's, you know, to the public or to employees, um, so to the regulators. And it's, it's um, I still remember, like, it's, uh, I spent maybe about six months just handling a like risk proofing ourselves and handling crisis and any sort of like negative feedbacks about us. And that, that was probably uh, the, the six months that I grew the most because you really realize that it's more than, it's not just the glamorous and, you know, like talking about your business, how great we are. It's also about, you know, how to defend ourselves and making sure that, you know, and a lot of the was misunderstandings, like whether people didn't really understand our business model properly, or you know, someone within the organization said something to someone else. And yeah, so I think that's sort of an area that I just sort of stayed with. Um, but because of all the different entities now we have around the world and the licenses, I still have quite a bit of my time just, you know, like dedicated to those go to markets and also yeah. like sort of man managing sort of how do we actually land in a country after we have that um, um, license. But I think that part sort of now became a process, whereas, um, you know, early days, there was like a lot of, you know, what should we do? How do we do it? Now it's just like, okay, we know exactly how to do it because we've done it in like, six, seven other countries before, but every country is a little bit different. Um, and we just sort of follow that process and making sure that we have the plan necessary and then we actually execute that plan and we hire the right people. So you talked about the fact that, you know, being a startup founder, is, there's a lot of aspects of the role that, is, that, that are not that glamorous and certainly maybe not as glamorous as they look from outside. <laughs> no doubt we've got a lot of, you know, budding or potential founders in, in the audience today. Talk to us about what, what's different. What's different about being a founder to perhaps what people who haven't started a company, even maybe people who've worked in early stage businesses but not as a founder, what's different about being a founder to perhaps what you would have expected or maybe to what other people might expect as sort of as part of the role of a founder? I don't think it's necessarily unexpected, but it's more like, you know, when people ask me, you know, how do you balance work and life? How do you like, they actually always refer to the startup as work or a job. But mm -hmm. I think every founder will agree that we never really sort of perceive this as a, as a job uh, in a sense. Um, you know, you, you sort of like, I'm always a believer <laughs> of work-life integration because that's just the lifestyle I chose um, being a founder. And, and, and I think, like I actually never really think about, oh, you know, how, how do I make sure that I take care of like both part of it? Because it sort of became one. And, um, you know, in terms of like founder dynamics, you know, like the, the, I think it's a relationship that's also like changing over time as well, because whenever there are issues, like, you know, when people are happy, like everyone's happy. And, but whenever there are issues, it seems to be like always just the, like the, the founders that are sort of um, not saying that everyone else is not chipping in, but like you, you do feel quite, um, I wouldn't say lonely, but you do feel like, you know, it's just the four or five of you sometimes because you're the one who have to make those difficult decisions. And um, more often or not, like, they are like like the, the whole um your 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 i guess your like emotions are sort of like changing over time as well um but there are hope like very very happy moments during the whole journey that you 
make you think that all, all of this is worthwhile and that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Can, can you maybe just share share one of those with us? So if, if there's a sort of particular moment you can think about where there was a sense of sense of pleasure, sense of relief, satisfaction, I, I think people would really love to hear about, you know, a, a specific experience you've had as a founder that's, that's really been impactful for you. Um, so I think, though, basically it's like... Uh, moments right within the whole journey that are the most memorable like we don't we're not a company that sort of look back a little like all the time because um funnily like at our fifth anniversary we were trying to dig out all the old photos and videos or anything and there's like nothing <laughs> so, like, sometimes i actually don't believe it when like companies like alibaba just all of a sudden pull out like all of those documentaries from like 20 years ago. Um, we had smartphones five years ago and we still don't have that many like moments. Now, like I'm very careful, like actually make sure that Jack and I, like we, we actually sit down and then document all of those things so that, you know, um, when looking back, there are, you know, memories to cherish. But yeah, right. um, yeah but so I think, yeah, so I think it, it could be like, um, we don't, we're not a company that celebrates fundraising, as you probably know. Um, but I think Series A, when we first got uh, money from Tencent and Sequoia, is definitely a, a key moment. Um, so 2017, um, you know, it was the first time that really we um, sat down and we started talking about three five-year plan. Because you know, as a startup, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in three years. So we never really had a three-year plan, um, but in uh, 17, we did. And our goal was to be a unicorn in 19, which we made it. So, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Jack's ugly unicorn, <laughs> like drawing is all over <laughs> and all its private channels because uh, we didn't like, it's not like we didn't think it's going to happen. We just sort of didn't really make it the goal because the, like business objectives are always like product launches or like user numbers or, um, you know, it's very data driven. It's very specific. Um, whereas mm -hmm. becoming a unicorn is sort of the result of it, right? Because you're doing yeah. something well, you reach that valuation. But um, it was still quite like, I guess, in a way satisfying to know that, you know, we've done something right. Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah. No, so let's talk, I mean, you touched on, on Tencent and Sequoia and they both participated in Tencent led the Series A and Sequoia, Sequoia China participated in the Series A. And you've built a, a, an amazing cap table of investors. It's been really, it's a diverse cap table in terms of types of investors, um, in terms of geographies of those investors, in terms of even the sort of areas of focus and stage that they, so it's a really, it's a really, really interesting cap table. Um, what, what have you learnt what, what, firstly, what have that group of investors brought to you? How, how have they contributed to, you know, the, the, the story? And, but also, what have you learned about capital raising that, again, may not be so obvious for, for people who haven't done as much for as Airwall Access? Mm, so I think in terms of capital raising, right, um, we, um, like, I guess we were always quite strategic like strategic in terms of who we take money from. And we're also quite, I guess, um, like we always sort of knew at different stages who to go to or like who is someone that we probably, so investor chemistry is something that's very interesting because we feel like it's not just about the money. Um, and the tempo is also very important because I think the first two or three times we were raising, we were cutting it very close. And it was also during Christmas and it was like, things can go, like so many things can go wrong one month prior to actually, you know, like closing the deal. So um, yeah, so we learned our lessons. So now we're very structured about how we raise, but I think prior to, I would say series B, it was more about the team and about, um, the vision and what we're doing and about like the whole landscape, you know, whether the market is big enough and whether you are someone who's gonna, you know, succeed in that market. Whereas I think after Series C is more um, 
data and, and we became a more data-driven company as well. So a lot of it always about metrics and numbers. And that's how you actually can manage a team of five or a thousand people because it's not just about, you know, what do we believe in anymore? It's about, you know, what did we do right or wrong and how we're heading towards that goal. Um, but I think I still think we're very fortunate to have the investor base that we have. Um, board meetings was not easy in the early days when we had no revenue. <laughs> but um, um, but I think we uh, think you know luckily enough our investors have always been quite supportive. Um, I would say adding big names helps with banking relationships as well as regulatory um, requirements just because you know it's, it's just how the world runs right like you yeah. need trust and you need um, to be able to demonstrate that you have that trust from multiple um, you know, like areas whereas um yeah it was a lot more difficult when we didn't have um the investors that we had um after series a um yeah so i think now it's just part of business as usual um but obviously we're now like um, looking at um how we can i guess accelerate so we you know from i think series the onwards, we also started to think about whether we can um, start to do some m as instead of doing everything ourselves. But um, that's sort of something that we, 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 we've had, we've been planning on, but um, haven't really had any um, news to share yet. Let's talk about not a lot of people in the audience won't be that familiar with, with the Australian technology ecosystem. Um, you know, <clears throat> we've seen Companies like Atlassian, which is obviously you know an older an older company, but now uh, I think a sixty or seventy billion dollar market cap, Canva, Air Wallet, so a number of companies. Oh, can are... I actually ask one question? Because <laughs> people probably are not sure investing in us as well. So I actually want yeah. to hear about you know like you know probably people will be curious about you know how we met and you know what yeah I mean I, I... made you invest in us. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was interesting. I mean, you know, we were we were introduced to Jack, and Jack and I met, and then Lucy, I think you and I subsequently met, and because you came into the our cap table at a very special time, I would say. We we came in. It was just it was an extension of the Series A, so it's just after yeah. ten cents and Sequoia and, and and others have come in. Um, it was still pre revenue. I think it was about a year a year before launch from from memory was was when we came in. Um, yeah. And, and we met Jack and then we, we came to the office. And actually, the first time I met Jack, he said to me, actually, we've met previously. And I said, really, I, I, I apologise. <laughs> I recall. He said, well, actually, you were speaking at an event at Melbourne Uni and there was like, you know, several hundred people there. And, you were, you know, it was our, it was our graduating class. And, um, and that was kind of one of the things that sort of influenced my thinking about becoming a, a founder, about becoming an entrepreneur. So it's like, oh, it's better to be lucky than smart. So that sort of, I think, created a bit of a, a really nice, um, you know, a sort of a nice rapport and affinity between us. But I think from, from my perspective, Lucy, was just, you know, it was such, you know, it was such a bold vision. There was clarity that there was a real problem to be solved and just a, a huge belief that we had that, that yourself and Jack and the rest of the team, and it was a, it was a small team at that point, it would have been, Probably 50 or 60 of you, I'm guessing. It was 70, 70 people at Sirius. Um, Sirius A. Yeah. So it would have been 80 or 90 probably then. And just a real, real belief just when after we met you guys, it's like, wow, this is this is a car. I remember going back at, at our partners meeting the, the next Monday and saying, we're going to invest in these guys. It, it's amazing. And, and obviously we feel very lucky to be on the journey. Yeah. So... So, so let me, let me let's, yeah, let's talk a little bit about Australia. And again, we, we don't need to spend too much time, but, you know, I think Australia has produced uh, and some quite diverse companies like Air Wallets and Canva and Atlassian and Vato and a, a, a range of really amazing tech companies. So I'll just talk a little bit about to give the audience a bit of an insight into, you know, what the Australian technology ecosystem looks like. Yeah, so I think with Australia, um, you know, we it's definitely very interesting to see that there are companies that popping up from different industries so like there's no one like very like obvious area where people are like very 
much focused in. Um, and the thing about, I think the thing I like about Australia is that it's very multicultural. So even from the early days when we were hiring, a lot of people actually came in from um, tech or you know companies uh, from overseas. So they actually relocated to Australia or they were Australians returning to Australia. So we actually have a lot of those. And um, so then it's, you know, people bringing different perspectives and, you know, um, people who have worked. Also, like a lot of them actually used to be the first employee of maybe an American company in, in APEC. So Australia is very, very um, um, popular in the sense for being the testing ground for, um, you know, Western companies entering into Asia as well as Asian companies trying to, you know, test out, um, you know, like uh, developed markets. And also it's like, in terms of time zone, it's, you know, it's in the Asia time zone, but it's, you know, yeah. So it's, it's, it's definitely interesting to hiring Australia all the time. And um, cause we do get these questions because, you know, people assume that because of the small, pop, like relatively small population, that how, how are you gonna scale the yeah. team? Yeah. Um, but um, interestingly, they are just a very diverse pool of people um, with different backgrounds that we can hire. And also, I think because the VC market in Australia is not that developed compared to some uh, of like some of the other countries, um, companies are very, I guess, uh, entering into like the revenue stage very early. Um, compared to air, other areas as well. So like for a Chinese company that's just IPO, it's still very normal for, for them to be burning money for like another two, three years. Um, whereas in Australia, everyone's sort of into revenue fairly early on, but that just means you also have a very healthy cash flow. And, and I think, you know, in that sense, it's a different um, environment, isn't it? It's not like as brutal as well because you know, no, everyone's like, like not burning a lot of cash. But um, yeah, I still think you know Australia is like a very core part of Air Wallets because we still have a fairly big team uh, there, um, and I think you know uh, uh, I still see a lot of opportunity in Australia for our products in terms of you know clients as well because. There's just so many SMEs, and in terms of the digitalizations of banking services, um, it's very consumer focused. I mean, we have the big banks taking care of consumers, but nobody's really focusing on the business areas. Um, yeah, vast uh, amount of opportunity, and then hopefully, I think there's still like a lot more startups now because I used to be the on the board for FinTech Australia, and at that time, we only had like 200 companies. Yeah. Um, now uh, I think there's like 800 or like has to be more than a thousand by now. So yeah, hopefully, you know, we, we're going to see a lot more coming out from Australia as well. Let, let's talk about fintech, obviously in a global sense. And so we've just seen an explosion, you know, in the last five or 10 years, we've just seen an explosion of um, fintech businesses, um, diverse areas, um, a lot of value has been created in, in, in fintech over, over that period, certainly compared to the preceding 10 years. What, why now for fintech? Why have the last, you know, what's been the catalyst or catalysts for such a change and such an explosion of activity in, in that period of time? So I think, um, you know, obviously the evolution of like technology itself has sort of fueled most, like most part of, like any sort of technology, whether it's FinTech or, um, you know, other types of tech. So we're talking about, you know, uh, cloud computing and also people moving on mobile. So obviously it means then a lot of things are contactless and people are looking for that more like seamless experience. Like nobody wants to walk into a branch for banking anymore because it's just time consuming. It's, you, you want things to be ready. And there's this urgency of things being at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I guess I, I'm probably going to be a bit more specific because FinTech is very big. So like if we're going to all areas, then it's a little bit different, but specifically to payments and to what AirWatch is doing, I think is really that the digitization of businesses. So, you know, we're thinking about, you know, in the old days when 
a comp like say for example i don't know coca-cola wants to expand globally it's probably going to take them years to you know build a new office and things like that whereas now a lot of businesses are what we call digital native from day one so you know thinking about airworks right we registered for a company we you know bought our amazon <laughs> web services we bought our cloud we bought you know all of those things we, we have a computer and we, we're ready to go and then we most of the things are built on SaaS. um you know we don't need a lot of like physical you know hardware anymore so most businesses are starting out like that um and it only makes sense that their financial services are digital native from the day one as well because then it can integrate with what they're doing um you know it can really be part of i guess the business operations as opposed to a separate part where you know they, they then need to you know uh spend more time and operations are so I think, um, which is why I think it makes a lot of sense for us to really invest in the business banking area, um, because I, I do believe there's still like a lot of opportunities there and businesses are like consumers because people are, you know, operating the business. So, you know, they are just like consumers when they're making decisions and they're making, looking for optimal user experience where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure your accountant wants things to be in their zero, like as opposed to <laughs> like handling sales all the time. So it's, it's small things like that and add it together means that, you know, you really need to like, I guess, revolutionize how, um, you know, people see banking and financial services at the, like right now in 2021. Right. Hey, we've, we've, I've got a few minutes left. I want to. I want to yeah. finish on on a, a more. I guess a sort of a more personal note. Um, you're sitting down talking to Lucy today. Is talking to Lucy five years ago, and 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 giving some advice about you know how to how to start a business, how to grow a business. What advice? What advice? Given now everything you know and all the experience you've had, what advice would you give to yourself starting out that journey five years ago? So I think, like, I've always been very competitive growing up, but I'm not probably not the most confident person. Um, like, uh, you can imagine, like, someone who has skipped a grade in high school is probably not going to be the most popular kid, right? Um, but I think, like, over the past five years, I've just made so many friends and partners um, in business. And I think, you know, it for the younger me, like, um, I would say that, you know, just go along with the ride and, and, and probably embrace the change because I'm a little bit um, like, like OCD about my life sometimes. Like, I really like to plan things out. I've like, I'm, I'm like having a, it's almost like I have a business plan for my life <laughs> and you can imagine it's probably not going to go always go as a plan. And so I don't do that as much anymore. Like I don't say like, I'm going to do this by certain age or like um, I'm going to be like someone um, in five years time. So yeah, because there's just so many things that could be different every day. And also the external environment, like who knew like we're going to have such a big pandemic in 2020 as well. So yeah. So the advice to the younger me would be to just take it easy and uh, not uh, let try go to a bit more. let let go a little bit more and um, embrace the change and don't like suffocate myself by you know like trying to making sure everything is in order and trying to be so controlling because yeah it's, how, how would you grade five years? Is five years in how would you grade yourself Lucy give yourself a good grade I think pretty good um pretty good I mean I start up I have like I call my daughter my second startup because it's just like starting over, she's <laughs> over now, how old is she she's two, uh, she's two and a half two and a half two oh. and a half and yeah it goes to show that time management is really <laughs> a, a, a something to master and yeah but um i'm pretty happy with absolutely it's an amazing lucy it's an amazing story um lucky to have the opportunity to talk to you today love 
we, we feel very lucky and uh, to have the involvement in, in Airworks. It's one of the great joys in my life. And, I really uh, hope to see you in person again. <laughs> absolutely. Hopefully we'll catch up before too long. Uh, who yeah. knows? But uh, thank you so much thank for joining you. us today. It's been a, a really, really special conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.